Merciful Father, I come here not so much to worship my parents, but through them and through Christ, come here to ask for strength from you, strength to go on with the search for their son, my brother Timothy, who lies somewhere in, in some shallow grave, perhaps in Angola. I come here to ask for blessings in my search for his remains so that I bring him back here. I also come here to ask for strength to resist the temptation of revenge, the temptation of hatred, and the temptation of refusing to forgive. Our country needs forgiveness and reconciliation because of the deep hate that has taken place amongst ourselves. We ask all this through your beloved Son, Christ. Amen. Yes, we heard a memorial service. Chief was a popular guy here. Remember, people were returning. So people were asking me, when is Chief coming? When is he coming? And it was becoming very difficult for me. I said, I don't know. Where is he? I don't know. When last did you hear of him? Never heard of him. Oh, you must be joking. Other people have visited their people. I said, not us. And I never heard anything about him until 1992, when two young fellows came and said, well, we are from exile. Brother Joe, they've been in MK. I said, oh, show so your back. Oh, glorious, you wonderful. And uh, where's Timothy? We call him Chief. Where's Chief? And he said, no, brah, Joe, he won't be coming back. And in a way, I felt proud. He died in combat. That's wonderful. He gave the supreme sacrifice for us. But what devastated me, I said, no, he didn't die in combat. He was killed. They tortured, maimed him, and just rubbed him off. And I've got the story. The bread which we break, is it not the sharing of the body of Christ? He was tortured like I was. And when I got into that cell, I couldn't tell who he was until he spoke. He was tortured and forced to agree that he has sold the movement's guns to the Angolans with me, which thing was not true. I thought what the regime did to me was bad. No, that's nothing compared to what he went through. When the system arrested me and tortured me, when they finished with me, they put me at the doorstep and said, take your rubbish were through with it. But my movement grabs my younger brothers and sisters, and for whatever reason, they get killed there. They kill them. But don't have the decency of coming and say, we're dealt with your rubbish. It's no longer there. It takes me 12 years to know that it's no more. When I'm waiting for him, I write poems. Come back. We are fattening the calf for you. There will be celebration when we come. The guy's long dead. And I rub shoulders with them. Comrades who know. And they call me Comrade Joe. But they don't say, we killed him. You can't even tell me where he's lying, where he's buried. When a soldier's fallen, at least you bring something that belonged to him. His spear, his broken spear, in my language, you say, Rai Kloboha. Hui Kloboha means allow us, give us something we hold on to, to let go that he's no more. My people, I can't let go. Let us pray, Areva Peleng. Mojimo, we give you thanks for the life of Chief, for what he stood for. We give you thanks, Father, for the truth that ultimately came up that he was murdered. 
One thing that I should tell you about is that he was a bold man. If you did wrong, he would tell you straight on the eye that this is wrong. You shouldn't have done this. He's somebody who is uh, open-minded, who could, you know, confront you and tell you what he thinks of you. Maybe that's what uh, got him into trouble. <laughs> More than the word wild. <laughs> Drinking sprees, social gatherings, girls most of all. And uh, I don't know, you know, you used to like partying, but he liked reading. He liked sitting home reading for quite a while and then he'll be off to his friends. Yeah, he liked women. And to him, <laughs> I think maybe we met when he didn't even consider himself a grown up, you know. He was still young and playing around because he could be with me and his other girlfriend in the same room and he wouldn't say any wrong about it, you know. Let us live and enjoy life, man. What's wrong with you, you know? He was that kind of man. Timothy, as much as Joe, you know, both of them, the foundation, it's the same. They grew in a home where morals was the thing of the day at home, where you were taught about humanity, you know, respecting another person for what he is, and where people were all equal, you know. That's why I'm saying we could relate to our parents, we could sit down and talk about issues, you know. So I see them having similarities and Timothy was a jolly person, very jolly. Joe is a little bit softy. <laughs> he gets touched very easily, gets taken up very easily. Uh, his nickname, Timothy, was Chief. And when we asked our father, why is he Chief? What does this come from? And he said, whenever I look at him, I see a king. He always knew that he, he's number one and he'll fight to be there. In 1990, political exiles began returning. With great expectations, the ceremony family waited. Chief never came. For two years, there was no word until Gordon Mashul, himself detained and tortured at Quattro Camp in Angola, returned with the news of Timothy's murder. Timothy was one of 12 cadres executed by order of an ANC tribunal on the allegation of being apartheid spies. And Gordon, tomorrow I'll be leaving for Angola. Mm -hmm. The idea, I'm trying, like I'm saying, I'm searching for the remains of our brothers, your brother, my brother, and may maybe many others. Many others. Yeah. I don't know where the graves are, I don't know where they are buried. I'm just going there with my fingers crossed and trusting in mm -hmm. faith that uh, I may meet somebody who will tell me in the environs of Quattro Camp where graves are. Don't you think I should draw you a rough sketch of of what the place exactly If you is. could manage that, that will be beautiful. Yeah, right, Luanda. Luanda. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can direct me to right. And to the north. To the north. Mm. And then the, 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 fire, the firing squad, please, mm. is behind Quattro. There's a ravine and a big rock. Right. Yeah, that's where that's where they were executed. Oh. The place of execution. Yeah. On Wednesday, October the twenty first, nineteen ninety eight, the morning of his scheduled departure for Luanda, Joe Ceremani was advised by the Angolan ministry that due to the worsening security situation, his scheduled trip to Quattro should be postponed for some time. Because of the civil war, travel by road in the region of Luanda was becoming increasingly dangerous. The 230 kilometer journey northeast to Quattro would now take two to three days and require a military escort. Contingency plans to fly from Luanda to Quattro by helicopter could no longer be guaranteed. No one was flying as this was now considered too great a risk. And it means that we consider the situation in Angola as extremely, extremely difficult for over the whole cross-section of society. It's, it's very, very serious. That's, I think, the most troublesome country in the whole region of Southern Africa. 
Accepting the probability that he would, on this attempt, not be able to reach Quattro, Joe nevertheless determined to enter Angola via Namibia, to get onto Angolan soil, and as close as possible to the region where his brother Timothy still lies. An active member of the Pan-Africanist Congress, in 1963 Joe was sentenced to six years on Robben Island. A splinter African nationalist movement, the PAC had broken away from the African National Congress and was responsible for launching the watershed anti-pass law campaign of June 21, 1960. This resulted in the Sharpeville massacre, which emblazoned indelibly the struggle against apartheid on the consciousness of the international community. At the time of Joe's sentence, Timothy was just 11 years old. On a special day like this, still this warm birthday greeting that comes from me to you is just to say I think of you and happy birthday too from Timothy to brother Joseph. That's in, on the 26th of August in 68. It's sent to, sent to me in prison. He's got a prison stamp here. Joe was again detained in April 1976 held, incommunicado for 28 months, brutally tortured. On his release, he learned that Timothy had already been gone for two years. Joe joined the South African Council of Churches, working with dispossessed rural communities, before being appointed head of the Justice and Reconciliation Division. We, the people of Koso House, dedicate ourselves, our talents and our programs to the service of God and of all his people in this land. During his years with the SACC, Joe was greatly influenced by then General Secretary Bishop Desmond Tutu, whom to this day he regards as his mentor and spiritual father. With his many years of grassroots experience assisting rural communities dispossessed of their land, Joe was a natural choice to head up South Africa's Commission on Restitution of Land Rights. <laughs> But for the Ceremani family, no such restitution. Only 22 agonizing years since Timothy left, never to be seen or heard of again. The day he went away from this place, he called me and I went to him and he asked me to come and collect his ID and passport. I didn't know that he was going away and for good, you know. He just told me that he was going to Mephi King and he might be going over to Botswana, that's why he needed the passport, but he'll be coming back, that's what he told me. And naturally because I went in and out of his home like it was my home, I came and asked his sister-in-law for the passport and the ID and I gave them to him. The next thing I had, he had gone on exile and they don't know when he'll be back. And then on the 31st of December, he phoned from Botswana and said, my sister, I'm leaving. I'm going into exile. And that was the last words that we heard from him. And the next day I was in the train to Botswana. And when we went there where he said that we'll find him, they said, yes, he was here. They are in a plane to Dar es Salaam. And I came back and I lost all the hope because I knew it has been put in our mind that if you go there, it's gone. You'll never come back. And it came true. He never came back. You know, it was, it was tough. It was tough. But I, 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 really, I, I really wanted, you know, I, I still want to know. What you know, it means there was a lot that was happening that he, wa he was afraid to tell us as little sisters. He, he was very protective, he was maybe protecting us from these things. And he said, I'm going to do it my way. The brutal response of the apartheid state to the June 16th student uprisings of 1976 saw thousands of young black South Africans over the following decade leave their friends and families to go into exile. Their burning goal was to join MK, the military wing of the liberation movement in exile, 
to get military training and return to liberate South Africa from the apartheid regime. Timothy Saramani, his ANC name Kenneth Mahamba, recognized as a young rising star, soon became commander, first of Kwibashi and then Pango, strategically two of the most important ANC camps in Africa. For the young cadres in ANC camps in Angola, a country impoverished by ongoing civil war, life was tough. Fresh meat, fruit and vegetables were non-existent and had to be flown in. In their absence, the daily diet was rice, beans and water. For these youngsters, keen to get on with fighting the apartheid regime, the deprivation of camp life and monotony of waiting for action resulted in serious discontent and even insurrection. And no electricity. No, no, there's no electricity in these camps. Simple things were missing, I mean. A library, you couldn't get a good book. There was no TV. Uh, you couldn't see a good film, I mean, you couldn't see any film for that matter. Um, hardly any games were, were you know, available, um, except what, except the kind of games that we, we sort of uh, invented ourselves or played, uh, and, and sometimes in the most primitive conditions. You see, people wanted to come back home to fight. They were tired of sitting in the camps year in and year out, and undergoing one course of training after the other and not being given a chance to fight. We had a record of about 6,000 youngsters that left South Africa for various reasons, but almost all of them were picked up by the NC. But because of the numbers, it was very difficult for them, you know, to scrutinize each and everybody. And of course, you know, our handlers, our controllers were able to send a large number of agents fairly easily. So their mission was mainly to send out information. As far as the ANC strategy and tactics and movement is concerned, mainly intelligence gathering. At one stage, 50% of the people in Kabashi were suspects. We're dealing with quite a volatile situation when a lot of the people in your camp are suspect when, you know, people are being constantly monitored by other people. It was against this background that Timothy Saramani was accused of being an apartheid agent. His behavior had allegedly become undisciplined in that he drove recklessly and destroyed a number of vehicles. He went on drinking sprees and was implicated in the fatal beating of a cadre. Accused of selling military hardware and of being part of a spy ring, Timothy Saramani was detained and tortured at Quattro Camp. In 1982, he was executed with 11 co-accused. The question raised is whether Timothy's behavior matched the profile of a trained apartheid agent. No, I don't think that would be part of the mission. I mean, you must appreciate the fact that an agent must never uh, draw attention to himself. And that was part of the training, should never draw attention to themselves. But you must also appreciate the fact that uh, the, the, the problems the ANC had in the camps was as a result of, of, of youngsters being very militant. They want to come back to South Africa. Whereas the older people, the more sophisticated people, they said, no, hold on. It is just not a matter of going into South Africa. There is a certain strategy to be followed. And it is also true that a lot of accusations had been made because of that and because of the actions of certain of those young people. All our agents uh, was on record, no doubt about that. But it seemed to me, you know, after the, after the change in government, records were destroyed. I realized, you know, that some of the material I left there, you know, was not no longer available. Never know the truth now. Unless, unless you can trace that particular handler, <laughs> and that would be impossible to ask. The story that went along with that shocked me that he, he would tend to be a spy, not the chief that I know, because chief came from a close-knit family. They loved each other, they would 
pick each other up if the one has fallen, you know. They were that close. And for Chief to be involved in politics, it was because of the, the heartache, the pain that he felt at what the, 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 the people did to his brother when they took him and jailed him and all those, you know. So how can he again turn back and become his, bro his own brother's betrayer? Well, I would really love to have the truth. Of course, that disclosure relates to me having access to records if there are any. And uh, it becomes very difficult to reconcile and to forgive when you don't have the information, when you don't see the other party expressing remorse, furnishing you the true detail. And the greatest thing is to have the remains of my younger brother sent back so that we bury him where he belongs. Well, uh, I'm in Namibia, my journey trying to get to Angola, to Quattro. Uh, but uh, I learned the situation has deteriorated and it won't be easy to get to Quattro by road. And therefore, it would mean we fly by helicopter to Quattro, but nobody's flying because there are equal risks. So that what I intend doing is to go to the border and go as far as I can go within Angola. I'll take a bit of soil there, Angolan soil, an interim measure to take the soil back to the graves of my parents. Well, I tried to go through and they were so agitated. I think the whole thing was the camera. They didn't want me to go through. And communication was very difficult. They don't speak English. I had to use a lady who was translating for me in English. But yet, they didn't understand. It only confirms that things are not quite okay here. There's a lot of suspicion going on. Well, I feel guilty in the sense that uh, he was my favorite. And I guess I was also his favorite and a role model. The many things that I loved, he loved. I taught him baseball at a very tender age. Music, we love jazz. And I learned he excelled in that. He even drifted into classic. He loved debate. I love debate. So, more or less, I molded him. My parents, uh, I have very good memories of them. They were very strict people, yet very fair. And bold, courageous people. My mother was very religious and inculcated quite a number of things into us. My mother used to say, when you're confronted with uh, all sorts of things, adversary, you must just ask yourself one thing. Are you on the side of truth? If you think you are, then stand up firmly. Don't give it up, no matter who confronts you. Another memory I have or have of her, in terms maybe of militancy, we were traveling Christmas time, you know, and then the train is full, it's busy. Then the ticket examiner came and said, ticket. And the old lady had secured her ticket and put it elsewhere. She didn't know whether she put it in the breast or in the bag. And when she went down to try and get her ticket, I think this guy became impatient and slapped her. Makho, kafirmate, quickly, nigga. And then when he did that, I sort of went, wanted to jump on him. As a child, I think I was about 10 years. And the old lady rudely pushed me down. Sit down. What do you think you can do? You want to fight? Can't you see this is an elderly person? Where's your manners? She says to me, and I say, she's a crazy old lady. Then, <laughs> confused me further, she got a ticket out and told this guy, he said, here's your ticket, you slept me. Don't worry, I'm not afraid of you. I could stand up now and hit you with my head. I'm conscious, but I'm not going to do it. In a few years time, this young man will deal with you for the things you're doing to me and our people. So that's the kind of influence. But fairness and justice, both of them, my parents taught me fairness. There is a Kosa word called Ukubisa which is also related to an Old Testament tradition where we know of a time within the life 
of the Israelites, where they had to go and get the bones of Jacob, an ancestor, and carry it with them. For me, the process of getting something from where Timothy has died is important in very many spheres. That bringing even a portion of the soil from Angola would be, because we belong to the soil, bringing a portion of the person and celebrating almost in a way the fact that this person has had the opportunity to live. Well, I think it's a little achievement, but at the same time it brings back the reality of this, that this is merely the beginning of the journey. Because uh, I've come here with all sorts of difficulties, but I'm on Angolan soil. And I think for the interim, it's a good enough a measure that symbolically I can carry Angolan soil and go and fulfill the rights that we need to do, place the soil on my parents' graves, so that in a way we form the ancestral connection. Maybe my sons will have to continue with the search until it is found, or if the government, our government, changes their attitude and become honorable as Africans, they would maybe facilitate this process, and not only my brother, but many who are lying here, and their parents don't know where they are lying. Joe's frustration with the position of silence adopted by the ANC leadership on the issue of Timothy and others executed at Quattro finally motivated him to approach the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. The TRC, under the chairmanship of Archbishop Desmond Tutu, was set up by order of President Nelson Mandela to investigate human rights abuses that occurred during the apartheid years. Joe's hearing was held at the Johannesburg Fort, place of incarceration for the PAC leadership in 1960, before they were shipped to Robben Island. I want to ask for the true records of those trials in Quattro Camp. I want somebody to come and tell me what my younger brother actually did that he deserved to be shot like an animal being put down after being brutally disfigured so that his best of his best friends could not recognize him. And where was the accountability that you couldn't account to his people and say he's dead? We want to know the facts and more than above that we want to be shown the graves. They must be exhumed, we must come and have decent burials here. Joe's unrelenting quest once more raised the specter of Robben Island and the bittersweet irony of his relationship with a fellow comrade, Andrew Masondo, who it would be revealed was the man responsible for authorizing Timothy's execution. Andrew Masondo would himself testify to the TRC about the brutality he suffered at the hands of the apartheid regime when imprisoned on Robben Island. Unbeknown to Joe, Masondo would later be recalled by the commission to testify in camera on the circumstances surrounding the execution of Timothy and 11 other ANC cadres at Quattro Camp in 1982. Welcome to Robin Island. We'll be docking very shortly. Well, it brings back quite a number of memories. Andrew Masondo, in this area, the most vivid thing that comes to my mind is that he really suffered. He was isolated by these uh, warders, the cleaners, brothers. They really persecuted him. He'd pass there, pushing the wheelbarrow up and down from here, carrying and then going chuck that all by himself, got it. But I got closer to him and we talked and then that's how I got to know him. Even when I ask him, he says, yeah, teacher, he's we are the hut. He pointed the gun at me and started beating me. I, I, I don't think I would have recognized myself when I left there. I was bleeding through the eyes, bleeding through the nose, bleeding through the mouth. On his release from Robben Island, Andrew Masondo would once again witness humiliation, torture and gross human rights abuses, only this time not as victim. 
As national political commissar of the ANC in exile, Andrew Masondo was responsible for procedures at Quattro, the ANC detention camp, a far cry from Robben Island. With its notorious camp commander, Gabriel Mtembu, Quattro became the fatal final destination for many dissident cadres and those accused of being apartheid spies, guilty or otherwise. Quattro was tough. I imagine Hitler, even though I don't know him, but I imagine Hitler. Quattro was a concentration camp. The cells themselves were extremely tiny, no windows, so essentially one was in darkness. There were no toilet facilities in the cells, uh, and uh, prisoners were allowed to use plastic five-litre containers cut off at the top. Now, uh, we had to do it in full view of all the other prisoners. It stunk so much that the stink from those containers actually rubbed off onto the prisoners. Once inside the prison, all our clothes were told to remove and given a grey overall type of outfit, which was extremely coarse and sewed in such a crude manner. So it meant that one's genitals were always in full view of the prisoners and the guards. Uh, the shoes were different sized military boots and sometimes tackies. Uh, if one took a si used a size 8 shoe or boot, one would be given uh, one size 6 and one size 9. You know, one would be large and one would be small. So it simply meant that walking became a nightmare. Among the human rights violations that we have was basically the humiliation. To go to the toilet, you had to say, bus. if you didn't, they refused you. At one time, a chap had diarrhea, and uh, they refused, and he messed himself up. And even playing us would say, Kikele, Kikele, Ele Tink, Ele Saldilandre here. The next thing that was also very systematic was the brutality of the guards. These guards were extremely young, about 16 or 17 years of age. And when one spoke to the guards, we were told that you'd have to kneel down and call them commanders. I mean, how does one call a 16-year-old boy a commander? That is virtually illiterate. Sticks were used, iron bars, electrical cords were used. Uh, prisoners were suffocated with plastic packets and plastic bags. Irons used to be heated in fire, and those used to be applied to different parts of the prisoners' bodies. This type of consistently brutal treatment was even meted out to us while we were chopping wood. The guards would just come up to you and say, well, you're a Mgrambe. Mgrambe meant a sellout and a traitor, and brutally assault you. But you see, the Tenas brothers, they had a great sense of humor. Evert again says, no, 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 no. These people are not working hard enough. Now, we've been pushing wheelbarrows up and down. So he says, no, it's not enough. So he puts two wheelbarrows. Yeah. So you come, they load, they, they've already loaded. So you can't rest. You go up. When you come back, he wants you to run. You find this one is loaded. And I looked at this and I say, yeah. I still have 13 years to do. There were several women that were kept at Quattro. And I would hear these women screaming that they were being raped. Uh, screaming night after night. These women were brutally raped on numerous occasions by the security guards of the ANC. Uh, one, all that one had to do was to see them once and see the manner in which they walked. But I saw them taking them down to the ravine behind the prison and firing shots. There's no doubt that he was tortured. We've made a finding that Timothy was a victim. 
of a gross human rights violation because he was executed. And the Commission has across the board said that executions of people in terms of the Geneva Protocols, they shouldn't be executed. You see, Masondo, because of the leadership position he held, accepted the responsibility for the extrajudicial murders. But they were at pains to explain that it was not a kangaroo court, that there were procedures involved, that there were, that there were rudimentary judicial instruments that had been developed. I didn't get the feeling 100% that they'd been able to get a total corroboration for the claims. But I think that a threshold had been crossed of verification, which, had, which they felt comfortable with when that uh, judicial commission handed down the sentence. And that in their view as a guerrilla army, they felt that they had enough to warrant execution. And the excesses I admitted to by Mtembo when he said that some comrades abused their power and literally got away with murder. I think that that needs to be looked at very seriously. We are saying that we understand that the apartheid conditions gave rise to a just struggle and that it is the key, um, it is the key issue which led to the struggle taking place. And we find nothing wrong with the struggle, but it is the mean sometimes which we find reprehensible. There's no situation which warrants torture. There's no situation which warrants the severe ill treatment of persons. There's no situation which warrants the killing of persons who should be protected. And I refer to the Geneva Protocols, civilians, people who are taken into detention, certain rules come into play and under no circumstances should those rules be violated and the ANC was a signatory to the protocol. My mind was very clear he was alive and he was going to come back and when he came back I know he'll have achieved so much in life because he was an achiever you, you know he, he was born with some other things in him and I know that he had that strong spirit in himself and I said God don't disappoint us I know he'll come back and I'm still asking God where why did he fail us why why him you know why him at times I see my father because my father since he went away he, he couldn't eat without asking one question every day. I wonder where my son is. I wonder what is he eating. And you know, that torture that he was living with. I wonder if these people know, you know, that they were breaking other people's hearts by this. I wonder, I wonder. I don't have any grudge against anybody. But uh, for us to have this thing laid to rest, uh, would be very much happy to have his remains brought back. And we, 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 we don't begrudge anybody. We just want the truth and we want <coughs> to reconcile with those who have done what they have done to Timothy. Dear fellow South Africans, accept this report as a way, as an indispensable way to healing, we will have looked the beast in the eye. We will have come to terms with our horrendous past and will no longer keep us hostage. Never again. Nuit virni. Gege food. There must be acknowledgement that wrong has happened. And in theological language, we're talking about contrition or repentance. And that once you are contrite, you then move to the next step, which is confessing, admitting you are wrong asking for forgiveness and the wrong the party must be willing uh, i presume to forgive 
and one hopes that we will understand that it is often a very long process, especially when a whole nation is involved. I wouldn't know what to expect when I meet the Archbishop Tutu on the Meta TRC. At high school, he was my English master, and I'm very grateful for him. He did wonderful work for us. And in fact, when we were in prison, when we heard that he was joining the clergy, we said, ah, oh, what a waste. Such a wonderful literature master going to join the church. What is he going to benefit? What's the church? We are losing a lot. That guy is very good, man. But when we saw his performance in church, I said, no, no, that, I think that was the right decision. Yeah, he was now more effective than when he was a teacher. I saw that he was my teacher, an inspiration, my role model, my spiritual guide or father. To this day, I regard him as that. And uh, I expect him as my spiritual leader to be with me, to help me with this pain that I'm carrying. We'll talk about it and maybe my little dissatisfaction with what the outcome, seeing that we have come to the end of the TRC process. But I still remain with unanswered questions. I said, where are the whereabouts? Give me access to the records. Return the remains of my younger brothers and many others. That does not happen. It's true. I would want to continue to know where my brother's remains are. And I can't make it now a selfish thing. Something tells me it is also other people. Not only him, he's not as more important than the rest. Yeah. Yeah. And coming again, I would say now, if I am giving problems, you taught me how to give problems. <laughs> by wanting the truth, yeah. by trying to stand yeah. for the truth when the moment has come. And I learn it from you, and I'll never forget it that you said and taught us that in truth there is loneliness. If you want to follow truth, you're going to be terribly lonely. I would want to apologize. I mean, if uh, you have felt that uh, I particularly had been uncaring of you, and that perhaps I, sh I should have at one time or another called you just for you to come and sit down and talk with me, uh, because, as you very well know, uh, for me, more than anything else, each person matters. Yeah. Each person matters enormously. There is a sense in which God is saying, uh, Joe, I depend on you. I depend on you to help me. You may not know where, but I, I'm asking you to help me. Uh, by bearing this cross, by bearing this pain and this anguish, uh, to the extent that it becomes unavoidable, it can't be reduced, to bear it in such a way that it becomes um, redemptive, that I would hope that uh, your anguish and your pain don't grow into a resentment that is corrosive. To say that uh, I'm not going to allow it to and bitter me. I'm going to uh, let it be uh, uh, the furnace, a furnace that uh, purifies me. And I hear you very well. I, I'm, Good. I'm very I would have wished that there were, say, more chairpersons of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and that we would have been able to deal with every single person but it's just been physically impossible. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. God bless you. Thank you very much. In what I hear, Andrew Masondo seems to be a very key figure in this whole thing. And I know Andrew Masondo. And those are the kind of people that, if it's true, we need to sit together. I don't say they must come and, you know, polish up my younger brother. I'll sit to them like African elders, to say this boy let us down, they must tell, he let us down. And the way the situation was rough, it had to happen, and we're sorry it happened that way. And if we, I must feel it will hurt me, but it's good when I get hit in front of them and we talk, and I can discern the remorse in them, because reconciliation 
cannot ever happen if there is no truth and justice and no forgiveness. Some 16 years after the murder of his brother, Joe finally came face to face with the man who had ordered his execution. The ANC leadership, having attempted to suppress the TRC report, maintained its position of silence. In spite of this, General Andrew Masondo broke ranks and, under the guidance of Anglican Bishop Joe Sioka, agreed to meet with Joe. The information which was ultimately found was that they, in fact, came to the movement sent by the enemy. Now, I belonged to what was called the Review Committee. Once the tribunal had either sentenced you to death or given you a hard sentence, we were to look, check. And if we thought that the, the facts that were presented to us did uh, show that, we then endorsed the uh, this. I've been listening very patiently and hearing your story, and I guess it is very relevant to you. But uh, can you put yourself in the boots of parents of these people, wrong or right? The story that you relate doesn't heal their wound, doesn't touch them. They just say it's one of those things that we don't understand because I have no ex to grind with you per se as an individual or with a movement per se. I'm just ailing, ailing like a human being, ailing for my brother. And uh, all the other detail doesn't, really don't clarify the matter to me. What stands out very clear to me from the information I have, and which is a gory picture that I fear, that makes me cry even though I'm alone, that he was badly disfigured, and I say, my comrades, could they be that cruel that they can disfigure face to that extent? These are just big questions. I don't know. No, I wasn't no. there. That, that, that. And secondly, we also come, I listen to you say, when is the general going to tell me who shot him right here? Who shot him? My interest generally from the bottom of my heart, I want to know where my brother lies to go and fetch him, whether he was a criminal, or a god, a master spy, or a wonderful comrade. That's okay, that's not for me to argue about. I just want his remains. Can you help me to go and fetch him? Okay, so there are really two things here, General. Um, he would like to know who actually executed his brother. That's the first thing. And the second thing he would like to know, where is he? Can he go and pay his last respect? I need to bring him back home. Bring him back home. Yeah. See, my, my, my. Firstly, let me say, oh. the ones, the, the, the person who shot him, was not shooting him because of his own reason. So what I'm trying to say, if a blame has to be apportioned, it cannot be apportioned on the, 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 the young person who did it. It must be apportioned to me. It has, must be apportioned to to, 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 to all those of us who did the review, it must be a portion to the movement as a whole because it was not a personal thing. I believe if I were in charge, I would have worried a person that I know personally, I swear ki kanakame, if you walked right into my house and said, Joe, you know what? These things happened. I would have got angry, but I would have said, thank you very much, my brother. Linna, I would have done the same thing in your position. But now what's very difficult is that there's this mysterious thing. No, they, you, uh, yeah. Joint responsibility, collective responsibility. To me, the ordinary person, all those things don't mean anything. No, I am simple Joe, yeah, who no. says, but we hate each other. And somebody must come to me and say, I hate you, I hate yours, 
please forgive me. Yeah. And I said, yeah, it's true, I get angry. Then I said, but you make things easier. But for as long as it becomes mystery, that is how I begin to say, you know, this lot cannot be trusted. I don't know whether you know that my daughter-in-law was, was bombed in, 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 in Zimbabwe by an enemy agent. We buried pieces. I know the man. But when we came back and my son said, what do we do? I said to them, no. This person was used. Because there I was no longer in a war situation. But in a war situation, I would have executed him. What I want to, 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 to make clear, you see, if I speak like a soldier, even my, my, my daughter-in-law, I've always said, well, she was the victim of, of the revolution. If I speak like a soldier. But when I start to talk as a father, for instance, As a husband, where my wife is dead because of what she went, underwent. When I talk of myself, what, the, what, what happened to me in Robben Island. When I have to talk about my daughter-in-law, then maybe the, the human part comes in. But that human part, sometimes, I tend to want to suppress. Because the human part with me might say, for instance, Musiya who killed my, my, my daughter-in-law, I should go and shoot them. The human part might say, I must go around looking for the Tlenan's brothers and shoot them. But the revolutionary in me says, it's over. You are our general in this country today. And I think you need to assist us. And us is not only Kenneth Mahamba. It is all those category of people who are lying there. Good, the bad, the saints, and, the, and whatever they are, and the angels, and the bad ones. I think you as a spokesman who understands what you're saying, I would, I would plead with you to carry that message to the leadership, to say, make it possible. There's nothing, harobaja. Make it possible, exhume all those bodies. We're not going to judge them. It's just too bad. Some died like heroes, others died like villains. But the crux of the matter, can't they be brought home? If we can find this thing, a, 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 this thing, somebody probably might be able to tell us that these people were buried there. I mean, for me, I do not see the reason why. If we know where they were buried, why we shouldn't tell? So the first candle that we light, we light the candle for those people whose memories about their loved ones who had died have been brought back to them through the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And TRC has raised quite a lot of things for people and therefore we have now the role as the SACC and other churches to begin to help the nation to heal. Wounds have been opened and therefore they need to be addressed in order that people can get on with their lives. And that is what I think is going to be the role that is going to be played by the SACC. Blessed and holy God, we thank you. We thank you that you are such a caring and loving God. We thank you for this opportunity to allow this to happen for two people who were initially hostile towards each other because of the lack of truth, to bring them together and having had the truth, 
that there has been reconciliation. I think we need each other. If I am convinced, I need to hold his hand and walk with him in the many who are like me, who see him as a devil, to say this is a human being with compassion and feeling. And I think he has to write also to hold my hand and walk me so that those who think that I'm anti-revolutionary must understand why I'm saying the things that I said, if he understood the things that I said. And I say it's reciprocal, the whole thing is mutual. I hold his hands to walk in those crowds who feel that he has been a devil and is a devil. And he holds my hands and walks with me to those demagogues and fanatics and zealots who think when you ask, you are anti. Father, I bring this bag full of soil. This soil is from Angola, where my brother lies buried, but we don't exactly know which part of Angola or grave. Bless, therefore, this soil. Amen. The unfinished business is to get the cops really back, the, the remains back. That's the cardinal thing that has to be done. It's not only Timothy, it's all those people, their matter also that must be brought back home and be buried properly. Merciful Father and Lord of all life, we praise you that we are made in your image and reflect your truth and light. We thank you for the life of your son, Chief, for the love and mercy received from you and showed among us. Above all, we rejoice at your gracious promise to all your servants, living and departed, that we shall rise again at the coming of Christ. Amen.